Mr. So speaker, I say good afternoon to you, to the honorable members here present, and of course to the members of the gallery, and all of those who are listening and viewing. Mr. Speaker, I feel quite proud to stand today to lend my fullest support to this bill that is before the Honorable House. We would, of course, all be cognizant that this is an annual exercise, the budgetary process, which is mandated by law under our Constitution, that we must, at this point, put before the Parliament for its approval our expenditure and revenue projections for the upcoming year. Mr. Speaker, before I get into the meat of my ministries, I would wish to take a moment, since others have pitched their submissions in the context of history, to say that I feel quite proud that by my tally, this is my 14th budget address. Mr. Speaker, in one way I'm proud that is my 14th, in another way it says that I'm getting on in age. <laughs> but it was 14 years ago that I came here for the first time, then in the capacity as leader of the opposition, and would have presented it from that side of the house. And I believe I've now graduated to this side of the house. And I have no desire to go back to that side of the house. But this process is an important process. And my own journey, Mr. Speaker, has been an interesting one because I reflected this morning that when I first contested a seat in the District 9, the good people of St. John's and St. Paul's in Nevis, that it was occasioned because of a tragedy the tragic death of the late, great Malcolm Guichard, who himself had been leader of opposition in this honorable house and who had given yeoman service to this country. And I was charged by my party, the Concerned Citizens Movement, to run in that by-election. It was on the 27th of August, 2007. It was a Monday. And uh, I believe that it is true to say that many perhaps didn't think that I had much of a chance. But I triumphed in that election by a mammoth total of 30 votes. <laughs> and so started my political life in terms of elective politics. There was and has always been a lot of sound and fury where I'm concerned in terms of politics. I don't know why, because those who know me know that I'm a quiet Christian type. <laughs> but for whatever reason, there's always been some level of controversy, some level of chatter. And so I was told when I won on the 27th of August, in the year of our Lord 2007, that it was a sympathy vote. Malcolm. And yes, I could understand because he was a great man who had died in unexpected circumstances. And so I came back and I would have, Mr. Speaker, ran because in Nevis, of course, we don't have the luxury of my colleagues over here. Every two years or so, we have to face an electorate. And so after 2007, I would have run again in 2010, federal. 2011, local, I went to court, came back in 2013, local, 2015, federal, 2017, local, 2020, federal. Do you have any elections that, Mr. Speaker? 2007, 2010, 2011, 2013, 2015, 2017, 2007 elections in the past 14 years. But I am not complaining about the number of elections. I make the point to say that despite all that has been said, I feel quite proud standing here to say to the House and to the nation that because of the grace of God and the support of the good people of St. John's and St. Paul's and the island of Nevis, number nine, my beloved constituents, 
that I have moved from my mammoth total of 30 votes on the 27th of August 2007 to 534 votes in the last election. Mr. Speaker, it tells me, therefore, that I am moving in the right direction and that the people of that constituency must see something that they are happy with because not only have they returned me to this parliament time and time again, but they have done so with increasing margins. Moving from 30 to 534 is significant. Not only that, Mr. Speaker, but the election of June 5th, 2020, created history on many fronts. We have heard the history created in number 11, where a seat was rested from the NRP for the first time in over three decades. We have heard of history created in number three. We have heard, of course, of history created in number one, where the gentleman boasts that he won three times. We, Mr. Speaker, have so many rookie parliamentarians who have now come and who are here. And it speaks well of the country and it speaks well of the process. It speaks to renewal. And that is why I started out by saying that I've had 14 years because I now feel a little long in the tooth. I believe the honorable member from number five would have been here before me. The member from number six would have been here before me. And the member for number seven would have been here before me. So other than that, I'm a senior parliamentarian now. So when I look around and I see the member from number 10, also new, it speaks to the strength of the democracy that we practice in the country. And I don't think that we should take it for granted. You see, in our country, we are quick to criticize. We criticize everything. If the government, as a relief measure, gives a $1,000, there'll be some who say you should have given two. If we gave two, I can assure you some will say it should have been four. That is the nature of our culture. But amongst the criticisms, Mr. Speaker, I think we must also recognize that this country has come a very long way. And that the parliament now has reflected in terms of its membership, a mixture of youth, a mixture of gender, indicating that all are welcome and that our people recognize that all have a contribution to make. And so why are we all here? Those who are elected are here because we went to the polls on the 5th of June. And having gone to the polls in 2015 and the country having made a shift, the question that happens in every election, will you continue with the government you have? or will you seek to change course? And the people overwhelmingly said, we will continue with the government we have. Not only will we continue with the government we have, we will increase the number of seats that they have. And speaking of my beloved Nevis, and the party that I'm now privileged to lead, Mr. Speaker, we created history for the first time in the 34 year history of the CCM we were able to do a clean sweep on the island of Nevis, winning seats 9, 10, and 11. 9, 10, and 11. I had, in fact, promised it in 2015. I spoke, I believe it was at Greenlands Park, and I promised that we would deliver 9, 10, and 11. My prediction was delayed, but ultimately not denied. And so, we created history. So when I hear others talk about the history, it's important. And I think our people must understand and put these things into context. Because it is clear that the people of Nevis have sent a message that these are who they wish to represent them in this parliament. I listened to the maiden speech, very powerful speech from the honorable member for number 11. He sounded like he had been here for a very long time. Of course, he has good experience because he has been in the parliament in Nevis for some time. 
But he said something which I thought was fundamental. And what did he speak to, Mr. Speaker? He spoke to the fact that it is only if you're here that you can contribute and make representation on behalf of people. Some people seem to feel that going on radio all day, every day, calling into every radio program, criticizing and pontificating that that is national development. That that can move the needle. And I have said, and I believe that is the message that the member brought, that you must first learn to win elections. Win a seat. Because that is the only way that you get in here to make a contribution on behalf of who? Your constituents. The people that you are supposed to serve. So a lot of the talking heads, a lot of the people who always are breaking news on social media, they must understand that there is a process, and if they want Mr. Speaker to be part of the process, there is no admission fee. I believe we pay what, $150? Yeah, that's what you're talking You pay $150, about. but it's not really an admission because you get back your money. Most of us don't lose our deposit, so you get it back. So, Mr. Speaker, I make that point to say that elections which are free and fair, and all indications from all of those who independently assess these matters have said that our election of the 5th of June was free and fair. Indeed, we are aware that the opposition sought to mount certain election petitions. That is their right. It is equally within their right that they withdrew them. Because at the end of the day, I believe they knew, as we all did, that the petitions would not go anywhere. And so, I believe that the fact that the Concerned Citizens Movement in Nevis was able to triumph in such a way is a clear message by the Nevisian people that at this point in our history, they have reposed their fullest trust and confidence in the Concerned Citizens Movement. At this point in their history, from the north to the south, from the east to the west, from every corner of the island of Nevis, they are saying, CCM is who we trust. We trust them in Nevis, and we trust them in St. Kitts. And that is why we are here. We hear a lot of chatter. We get ridiculed, let's say, because we are in the house in Nevis and we're in the house in St. Kitts. Well, I don't stop nobody from being in two house. But to get in the house is a process. Mr. Pre Mr. Speaker, that is the point, you know. To get in the house is a process. And if the 100 meter line is marked out and Tukmun Saman Bagai could go to the line, I said to all who are concerned, put on your boots and come. Yes. That is what you must do. Because there are some people, and all they do is natter, 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 chatter, chatter, chatter. Natter in neighbors of extreme negativity. That's all they do. But you say to them, put yourself in a position if you legitimately want to make that contribution and you get no answer. I raise the point, you see, Mr. Speaker, because I've heard a most unusual argument in the public space. And what has that argument been? They say that Mark Brantley, the good member for number nine, he good at winning elections. <laughs> well, that is not what elections are about. That's like saying Usain Bolt is good at winning the 100 meters. Well, that's not what he's supposed to do. Viv Richards is good at batting. Well, what is he supposed to do? He's good at winning elections. As if people do not understand, Mr. Speaker, that one doesn't win an election, you know. One has to work. And people have to go out and vote. And when those votes are counted, that is how a winner is determined. So inherent in winning an election is the clear confidence that the people have in going and putting their mark next to your name. And in the last election, the people put their mark next to the names of those that they had confidence in. And look at the margins. The margins in the main were much larger than they've ever been. 
the truth be told that the team unity candidates, those for the PLP, those for the PAM, and those for the CCM, we did far better than we had ever done. And that sends its own message. It says that in the last five years, people were satisfied that we had managed the country in an effective way. With all the allegations that have come, with the constant barrage of accusations in the media, it sent a clear signal that people were satisfied with how the country was being managed. And for that one must credit the Prime Minister and the team. Because leadership is not easy. I know, I am leading Nevis as Premier right now, it is not easy. It is not easy in the best of times, Mr. Speaker. It is even harder when you have a pandemic like COVID-19. Imagine, if you will, that the country relies so heavily on tourism. All of us now would have seen thousands and thousands of tourists walking about Basti and Charleston. They would have been on the beaches, Reggae Beach, Pinnis Beach. The young fellas with the monkeys would have been making a dollar. The jewelry stores, my office happens now to be at Port Zante. You go down there now, it's a ghost town. Only a handful of stores are open and those that are open are struggling. The reality is that one of the main engines of the economy was taken offline. Crews, dead. Hotel sector, dead. Airlines, borders closed. Imagine, Mr. Speaker, March, April, May, June, July, August, September, October. Eight months the country shut down. And through the grace of God and the effective management, all of our public servants were paid and paid on time. All of our statutory corporations and their workers were paid and paid on time. I heard the Honorable Senator and Minister with responsibility now for trade indicate earlier that Sinkis Nevis is paid up in terms of all of our dues to regional and international organizations. We are paid up all of our obligations under any international treaties to which we are party. And these matters speak what they speak to the good governance of the country. A lot of people seem to feel, Mr. Speaker, that good governance is all about freedom of information, integrity in public life. That is all they talk about. But good governance also speaks about paying your debts, being on time, being able when you go to the OAS or to CARICOM or the OECS to put up your hand when they say who is best in class. That's also good governance. And I'm always pleased to know that this country is current with its obligations. The Honorable Senator and Minister of Trade has just said to me, CARICOM Regional Organization for Standards and Quality, US 8,789 paid up. GATT, General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, US 32,000 paid up. Caribbean Competition Commission, US 9,000 paid up. Office of Trade Negotiation, US 24,000 paid up. Caribbean Export Development Agency, CEDA, 16,000 US paid. Pan American Standards Commission, and I go on and on and on. The point I'm seeking to make, is that that too must be put in the context of the good governance of the country. Because as we look around our region and our world, and COVID has spared no one, rich and poor, presidents and paupers, all have suffered. It spared no corner of the globe. When we look to the north, we see the most powerful country in the world brought to its knees by COVID. I saw some figures which suggest that the United States of America, the most powerful country this world has ever seen, that they have lost now 
some when you are of 22.2 million jobs due to COVID. Well, you must lose work if you're in shutdown, lockdown. People can't party, they can't go to the bars and the clubs, hotels. So imagine us, little thing is nervous, and that's why I like to put things in context. Not, Mr. Speaker, to make some comparison to seek to denigrate anybody. But comparisons allow you to put things in context. Because we're the smallest country in the hemisphere. The smallest. And yet when we hear the reports, we recognize that St. Kitts and Nevis continues to perform best in class. You heard about the stimulus package, the size, the breadth, the depth. Where else had that kind of approach? You heard about the approach to agriculture and our farmers. Where else did you hear a country pivot to food security in such a way? You heard about the relief when the Honorable Prime Minister and move of the bill said that he had leveraged his own position as a member of the Monetary Council to persuade the central bank to in turn persuade the commercial banks to grant a moratorium on loans. Imagine if our people out of work still had the pressure of paying their mortgage every month. So when you talk about good governance, you talk about taking care of people. You talk about putting people first, having policies that are centered around people. COVID-19 and our response, in my respectful view, Mr. Speaker, was best in class. Our response was best in class. We don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. We have seen an outbreak in our sister OECS and CARICOM country of Grenada. And COVID, because of its nature, we can't tell you with any degree of certainty that tomorrow or next week or next year, something will not happen here. But I have gone on record, and I go on record again, to congratulate the leadership in the country, to congratulate those who worked tirelessly, to congratulate the task force nationally and the one in Nevis who worked tirelessly, Mr. Speaker, to keep us safe. Now, I think the statistics are 28 cases. We have had no deaths, praise be to God. We have had no hospitalizations. And most of the cases appear to have been mild. We have four cases now that we're told are recovering, and all are imported. So we've had, importantly, no community spread. Notwithstanding, I urge our people to continue to be careful. If Grenada is any example, we know that overnight things can change dramatically. So I urge our people to continue to be careful. Do the things that we are told we must do. Wear a mask. I'm not wearing mine now because I'm speaking. Sneeze or cough into your elbow, they tell us. Wash your hands with soap and water or with hand sanitizer. And above all, maintain that physical distance because we're told that COVID needs the body. It needs a carrier in order to transmit from one person to the next. But look at our response, Mr. Speaker. The smallest country in the hemisphere. I have a good friend in Dhaka, Senegal, the heart of Africa. And he sent me something. Lord, it was in French, and I don't speak French. But I recognize at number one, San Christophe El Nevis. And I said, well, that got to be us. And he said something, and he said to me that Senegal publishes an index of countries from one to whatever that are safest. And St. Kitts Nevis, in the context of COVID, was the safest according to their index. It says something that a little country such as ours could be an inspiration to those as far away as Africa. It says something. And I am a big advocate, Mr. Speaker, of raising my voice and encouraging our people to raise their voices, to extol the virtue and the greatness of our country. Because too many of us feel 
We come from a small island or a small country and therefore somehow we are less than. Somehow we are less than. I have been to the University of the West Indies, I hear them talking. You know? Say, oh, they used to tell me when I get a long distance call in the Nevis, the operator put your head out the window and call, Mark, come for your call. Because they say we're so small. <laughs> we must take pride in our country. I am not here to suggest that we are perfect. God knows that the only perfection that the earth has ever known was the Garden of Eden. And even there, Cain killed Abel. So we recognize that we are, by our nature, imperfect. And imperfect people cannot design a perfect system. We recognize that there will and will always be difficulties. But my task for the short time that God allows me to occupy these halls is to encourage our people at all times to be proud of our country, to celebrate each other, to celebrate our achievements. And our fight against COVID-19 has been stellar. The leadership has been stellar. In health, in finance, in security, it has been stellar. And I am privy to all the criticisms. Up to two, three days ago, a young lady contacted me, said she had a relative that died. She wants to come for the funeral. I said, well, you have to quarantine for 14 days. She said, that is unreasonable. You all have been ridiculous. We heard some commentary from the opposition benches. Everybody has an opinion why you don't. Let people quarantine for three days. No quarantine at all. Test on arrival. We understand. And I believe it's the WHO, if I've listened to the Minister of Health properly, that has said that each country must design something that's fit for purpose. There's no one-size-fits-all approach. St. Lucia, for example, at one point was considered the platinum standard. Then what happened when the community spread? And suddenly they were no longer the platinum standard because the nature of COVID is something that we must continue to adapt and adjust to. So, Mr. Speaker, the response by Sink It's a Nevis, the response by the Prime Minister, the response by the Cabinet, the response by our people, because let us also give the people of Sink It's a Nevis some credit. It couldn't have been easy for people to be told that you must be locked down. We know the member for number five, he likes to have a little nightlife. The member for number two is fast falling in his footsteps. He's ahead of him, he says. It can't be easy to tell people you're locked down or you must go line up to get food from supermarket. You remember we divided the country in zones. One zone could go to there to buy food, the next zone will go some other time. So you have to give our people credit because I said early in this pandemic that the one thing I feared most was the indiscipline of people. Because COVID-19 required us to exercise a certain level of self-discipline and discipline at the community and the country level. And where we have seen problems, not only in the region, but in the wider world, it has largely come from people who refuse to wear their masks, they insist that they must party, they must get together, and then you hear about the spread. Incidentally, I saw a report somewhere in social media of a young man in the United States who the police saw him on the sidewalk and stopped and said, aren't you supposed to be in quarantine? He said, yes. Police checked, he said, you had tested positive just two days ago. He said, yes. Why are all those people in your house? He said, well, I'm in quarantine, not them. So they come over to spend time with me. <laughs> in discipline. So we must give the people of St. and Nevis some credit because we were calling upon people to do something that we had never in our lifetimes had to do. State of emergency. Yes, we've had states of emergency before. I can recall, in living memory, one on the island of Nevis, until now. You've had one down here in St. Kitts, but they have not been extended, I think in 1993, if memory serves. 
but it had not been extended to the island of Nevis. But here you had people locked down. So you must give our people some credit. You must say to them that we are grateful to them for the discipline that they have exercised. And we must continue to encourage them to exercise that discipline because this is a fight for our very lives. Not only for our livelihoods, but for our lives. So going back for a moment to the response. And what I'm calling the genius of the Prime Minister as Minister of Finance and the team at the Ministry of Finance. Because to navigate this ship, smallest in the hemisphere, least resources, smallest population, smallest landmass, to navigate this particular ship during this turbulent time of COVID-19 is nothing short of miraculous. You hear I just tell you everything paid up. Everybody paid. Stimulus to try and help those who needed it most. Could we do more? Could we have done less? That is for the critics. But it's easy sometimes to stay in the pavilion and cricket playing and every shot the batsman play you say is a stupid shot. Every ball the bowler bowls you say you should have bowled that shorter, bowled that faster, bowled that slower, turn the ball more. But you know, you in the pavilion. And you can never win a game from the pavilion. I see some now entering the political arena in Nevis and they want to do it from the pavilion as well. Because they're not going to see it to run in. You can't from the pavilion. So you must give some regard to those who are on the field of play. Because it is there that decisions are made. And there that things either go right or wrong on the field of play. And when all was said and done, the Prime Minister and the Cabinet were on the field of play. And it will be for history to judge us. But I think based on what we have seen so far, the country can be proud. And that is why on the 5th of June, the people in a free and fair election sent the clear and unequivocal message. We approve of the job that you're doing. We are going to increase the mandate that you have because we want you to be the ones to continue to do that job. The mind may change tomorrow. The voice of the people is the voice of God. But we know right now they are with us and we are with them. That, Mr. Speaker, is what I can say unequivocally because it's supported by the facts. The people have reposed their trust and confidence. And so, despite the natural neighbors, despite the negativity, despite the criticisms that come, our people have spoken eloquently to what they want. And we have to listen to them because they went out and they exercised their franchise. We didn't have the election in private. It was not a surprise. Everybody had the same chance. And the people went out and did what they needed to do. It was a statement by our electorate that they have confidence in what we have done and what we continue to do. And therefore, Mr. Speaker, the historical nature of this election, the number of new people in the parliament, women in the parliament, young people in the parliament, some not so young in the parliament, the mix in the parliament, it gives us hope. And it says to every young boy and girl out there who might be listening now, that they too can aspire to be right here. I like to use myself, you know, because I was born not in a hospital, but in a house on four stones in a place named Scarborough in Hanley's Road. And I always say that my story is not particularly remarkable. But to come from a house on four stones, no running water, no electricity, and I don't know what you call it down here, but we call it a pit latrine, upper lane, that you had to go. If night come and it's dark, couple smoke your pipe. You had to walk up the lane and pray to God you don't make a crap or no cockroach when you get up there. To come from that to stand in the national parliament and address the nation from the national parliament is significant. And it ought to send a message to any boy and girl listening right now that once they 
aspire and they're prepared to work, they can be anything that they want to be. Anything that they want to be. They're limited not by the circumstance of their birth, but only by the ambit of their ambitions. And this type of messaging that our country is in good hands, our country is an important country, punching well above its weight. Well, well above its weight. And we will get to that because you would have heard the reports from the other ministries. I'm going to get to my own report shortly. Because notwithstanding COVID grounded all of us. We couldn't fly. We couldn't go about the world as we're accustomed to. But the work at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Aviation did not stop. And I'm proud of the team led ably by Prominent Secretary K. Bass, a model public servant. And the team she has around her, we have a small cadre of foreign service officers, but the capacity that they have, the intellectual capacity, the reservoir of goodwill and intellect that resides in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs is second to none. And so, Mr. Speaker, when I go around the world and I hear big Jamaica say to me, how you all get it done in sink his knees? How you all get it done? You go around the world, you see missions and embassies and chancellors around the world. Some of them have hundreds of people in them. Little sink is may have two, sometimes four, if you're lucky. But they get the work done. We are current with our obligations, current with our memberships, punching above our weight. Ladies and gentlemen, members of the parliament, Mr. Speaker, the simple point I'm trying to make, let us be proud of our country. Let us be proud of our country because our country has done well. And I'm not making a political statement to say, well, only under unity. I think we've done better under unity. But the country has done well since independence. We are best in class. I go around the OECS. I know they look at us and they know to themselves that while some are bigger, not some, all are bigger, they still see us as best in class. And we must be proud of that. Mr. Speaker, we all know, because we stood in a budget debate last year, that 2020 was supposed to be a big year for the world. A lot of things were supposed to happen in 2020. Good things. In my own little nevis, I remember like yesterday the sense of euphoria that I felt. Because the hotel sector in Nevis was telling me that they had their strongest bookings in the history of those hotels. They had, Mr. Speaker, bookings until July. Solid bookings until July, when we know that tourism is seasonal, and so most times by March or April, things start to slow down. I felt good. In fact, there were some who wanted to start to spend the money, even before it was earned, because we all felt good. And then along came COVID, and everything changed. So it was destined to be a big year. In the context of foreign affairs, 2020 brought an end to the Cotonou Agreement. Brexit became a reality. United Nations attained its 75th year. And 2020 also marked five years into the Sustainable Development Goals or Agenda 2030. Because of COVID, we had to postpone the 26 Commonwealth Heads of Government, Shogun, which was supposed to be in Kigali, in Rwanda. We had to postpone COP26, which is the UN climate, and we had to postpone the Oceans Conference. Others were simply canceled as a result of the pandemic. UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres said in April, Mr. Speaker, and I quote, the COVID-19 pandemic is one of the most dangerous challenges this world has faced in our lifetime. It is above all a human crisis with severe health and socioeconomic consequences. He said that in April, but eight months on, the refrain is the same. In the global system, COVID has been unprecedented. 
an unprecedented phenomenon, Mr. Speaker, like nothing that we have ever experienced. We have seen and we watch the news every day, spiking cases all around the world, Canada, US, UK, lockdown. Imagine a big city like London, lockdown. Germany, all across Europe. We saw the tragedy that occurred in Italy unfolding on television screens. All across the world, people have died, families have been destroyed, health systems have been stretched to a breaking point, economies have been destroyed. I take this opportunity, Mr. Speaker, to convey my personal condolences to the many families who have lost loved ones as a result of this virus and pray that fond memories of their loved ones will live with them forever. I have already commended our task force here for the work that they've done, and I continue to appeal to our citizenry to be vigilant. Mr. Speaker, one may, however, form a view that COVID was all bad, and I don't want to sound too disjointed in terms of my presentation, but COVID also presented some opportunities. We have, for example, seen an increased level of global solidarity and bilateral partnerships since COVID. It has reinforced the old adage that no man is an island. And it has shown us that inter-country and intergovernmental interdependence. It has highlighted the collective and multilateral approaches to combat crises such as these. We have been able to witness, Mr. Speaker, as never before, a united front among the international community against the virus. Friend and foe alike have had to come together to fight the spread of COVID. Our bilateral partners, I come now to the heart of what we do at Foreign Affairs. Our bilateral partners have stepped up to the plate Mr. Speaker, I have a little story I want to tell in my own way. We got a call that a company here in St. Kitts Nevis, Harrow, API Harrow, where ordinary members of our community work, that they made some special part. Will you say the name? Resolvers. Resolvers. That were necessary for ventilators. And we were being told at the time by the WHO and by everybody that ventilators were in high demand. So much so that even some of us who could find the money to buy ventilators couldn't get them because there was a backlog. Imagine that, you know, Mr. Speaker, I want the people to understand you have money to buy but you can't get because such is the demand that the big countries were grabbing. But the call came, I recall from the US ambassador. What was the call? They are asking, little St. Stevens, I want people to understand that the great United States of America asked little St. Kitts and Nevis, could you please, please allow the people at API How to continue to work? Find a way to allow them to work so that we can get the part. You say revolver? Resolver. Resolvers. We can get the part so that we can manufacture much needed ventilators in the United States. You see when I talk about interdependence, the greatest country in the world coming to the smallest country in the world saying, please allow the ladies and gentlemen who work at API Harrow in the island of St. Kitts to go to work so that we can get these resolvers. So that we can continue to manufacture ventilators, which at the time was said to be critical in the fight against COVID. And I well recall that a call came in from the White House to speak to the Prime Minister on the matter. So the task force and so the efforts of the Prime Minister and the team, API Harrow was allowed to work. 
and the parts necessary made their way to the United States and the United States was able to continue to manufacture their ventilators. I say that simply to set out the extent to which we are connected and the extent to which, Mr. Speaker, the greatest country in the world call upon the smallest country in the world for assistance. This is an important lesson. And when we talk about diplomacy and say diplomacy matters, I think the public must understand that it is through diplomatic efforts that these things happen. So the United States of America, they then said that they will provide us with 10 ventilators. And I assume that the ventilators that they sent had parts in them from API Harrow. Our dear friends, the Republic of China, Taiwan. They donated ventilators, rapid test kits, hundreds of thousands of masks, thermal detectors, thermometer temperature guns, other medical supplies. I would wish, Mr. Speaker, to go on record my capacity as Minister of Foreign Affairs to publicly thank the government and people of the Republic of China and Taiwan. I have said so repeatedly and I say so again that they have proven not only to be a friend to St. Kitts and Nevis, they have proven to be our best friend. Because in every facet of our development, the government and people of Taiwan have been there to assist. And we must say thank you to them. Taiwan has in fact served as a model in the fight against COVID-19. The Taiwan model, as they've called it, is now accepted globally as the way to respond to this type of pandemic. And that is why Sinkis Nevis continues to call on international organizations like the WHO and others for Taiwan to play its full role because Taiwan has something to offer. The Republic of South Korea donated some 50,000 US dollars. We have been able thus far to get some 300,000 US dollars from India. And our dear friends, the Republic of Cuba. What can we say about Cuba? Cuba is a model of resilience in a hostile environment. Having had an embargo placed on them now for the last 50 years at least, Cuba has nevertheless, despite their own hardship, been willing to extend the hand of friendship not only to St. Kitts and Nevis, but to other Caribbean countries and to the world. When I looked at my television screen and I saw that doctors from Cuba were headed to Italy, into the heart of the pandemic in Europe to help, I had to say that this was truly something phenomenal, Mr. Speaker. And Cuba, I'm told they send over 30 nurses and four doctors here all highly trained, who are serving to this day in both Sinkets and Nevis. The Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela. Mr. Speaker, when our students were stranded in Cuba, we liaised with our colleagues in Venezuela, and the government of Antigua, and Venezuela was able to assist us with transporting our students home. Diplomacy at work for the benefit of our people. I'm sure parents were happy to see their students, their children, I'm sorry, and the students were happy to be home. That, of course, when you talk about management, I remember when the Minister of Education, then the member for number five, came and said to the cabinet, we have to bring home students from Jamaica. All of these things the government did. Why? Because we recognize that our purpose, Mr. Speaker, is not about self, but about serving others. We also had tangible contributions to our overseas missions. I want to single out Her Excellency Jasmine Huggins, our ambassador, resident in Taiwan, who through her networks was able to secure a donation of three ventilators each cost in excess of US $19,000. Her Excellency, our High Commissioner Sherry Truss, 
in Canada, who with the help of the diaspora community in Canada was able to donate cleaning supplies to the Ministry of Health. And so we say thank you to all. Because while I identify those in the context of our diplomacy, we had our own local companies here and individuals who contributed massively to our fight and continue to contribute to our fight. I have said that on the island of Nevis, I have never seen such a coming together of people. I saw people delivering pizzas, home-cooked meals, to those who are on the front line, the nurses, police officers. I saw a youngster set up a tent every week and provided meals to everybody. People came together and I want Mr. Speaker, for us as a country not to lose that valuable lesson that COVID taught us, that at the end of the day, we are but dust. At the end of the day, none of us have any control over our destiny. And the only thing that defines us is our ability to come together, to work together, to love each other, to take care of each other. And COVID demonstrated that to us, and we must take it to heart. We did not in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs stay quiet, notwithstanding we couldn't travel. Because one of the lessons that we were taught by COVID as well is that we can use technology to work in a way that replaced the need for us to be in close proximity to each other. So in the past, when the UN General Assembly met, all of us had to spend tens of thousands of dollars to journey to New York, to stay in hotels, we jack up their prices once they know it's UN week, and to have a bunch of meetings face to face. You know what happened this year, Mr. Speaker? The UN met virtually. The UN met virtually. So what that meant was that leaders didn't have to travel. They were able to participate in the UN General Assembly for the first time in the 75 year history of that organization. They did so virtually with the use of technology. And we now see, therefore, digital diplomacy, the use of technology coming to the fore. And I am prepared to predict that even as we await a vaccine in our part of the world, and even as some predict that the vaccine will restore some sense of normalcy to our lives, that technology is going to continue to play an increasingly important part in how we interact with each other globally. And you know the thing I like most about it, Mr. Speaker? It is a lot cheaper than the alternative. The amount of money that we would have saved on travel, hotels, per diem, and all this kind of thing, simply by now using Zoom, using go to meeting, whatever the options are that people have been using. Because you stay in the comfort of your office or in your home, and you simply log on and you have the same effect. It doesn't cost you a fraction of what it would cost if you were forced to travel. And so the use of technology that COVID has forced upon us has really taught us some lessons. The ministry, arrange virtual meetings for me to engage with a number of our bilateral partners, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank again our permanent secretary and our foreign service officers. They're always thinking. So one day I got a call and I said, Minister, we are arranging for you a series of virtual meetings with bilateral partners around the world. Why? Because we want them to know, despite COVID, St. Kitts and Nevis is still here. We're still relevant. We still value the bilateral relations. And I was able to meet with Argentina, Australia, Brazil, Chile, Germany, Kenya, Kosovo, New Zealand, Portugal, South Korea, India, Indonesia, Japan, Mexico, Morocco, Rwanda, Romania, Spain, South Africa, United Kingdom, and our friends in the United Arab Emirates. I met all of them, Mr. Speaker. Some I met from my office in Charlestown, some I met from my office in Bastia. I never traveled and went a place. But I met them, and you know what? 
struck me about all of these engagements? The clerk is here, she was involved in a few of those engagements because when she's not here, Mr. Speaker, dealing with high matters of state, she works with us and is one of our valued foreign service officers. I emphasize valued, Mr. Speaker, lest anybody has any ideas to the contrary that she ought to be stolen away from us. Valued foreign service officers, multilingual. In this house, we only speak English, so she's of greater value to foreign affairs. But she was involved in some of those meetings. And in some of those meetings, Mr. Speaker, she will confirm that we were actually celebrated by some of these countries. Why? Because they had not thought of this kind of initiative. It was an initiative born of us to reach out to them and say, we are still here. Tell us about your experience with COVID. Listen to our experience. How can we learn from you and exchange ideas? And how can we advance our bilateral arrangements? 21 countries we engage with in that way. Mr. Speaker, in September, I assumed the chairmanship of the OECS Council of Ministers Foreign Affairs and was able to chair the sixth meeting of this forum, again, virtually. That was held in early September. We reiterated at that meeting our commitment to joint diplomatic efforts across the globe, and in particular on the continent of Africa. The 7th to the 8th of May, 2020, I'm, I'm outlining these, you know, Mr. Speaker, because some people felt that because we weren't traveling, we weren't working. I want to assure the public that we continued to labor in the vineyard of diplomacy. So on the 7th to the 8th of May, 2020, I joined my regional counterparts for the 23rd meeting of the Council for Foreign and Community Relations, COFCO. This was chaired by my Haitian colleague, and we're able to deliberate on our bilateral relations, including the UK post-Brexit, US relations, Africa relations, the Cuba summit, and Latin America as a bloc and the European Union. Mr. Speaker, we also examined our multilateral and hemispheric relations, including with the UN, OS, CELAC, and the ACS, and pursued means to strengthen the integration process in the region. A significant outcome, a significant outcome, was the decision to fly the CARICOM standard alongside our national flag at all of our missions across the world. I am pleased to report that the cabinet of St. Kitts and Nevis supported this noble idea and all of our missions now, wherever they are, fly the CARICOM standard alongside our national flag. A potent symbol, Mr. Speaker, of regionalism at work. On the 18th of September, in the middle of our independence activities, I was able to participate in the 13th special meeting of the Council for Foreign and Community Relations, COFCO, within the margins of the 75th UN General Assembly, again virtually. During this meeting, we were able to rally support for regional candidatures, engage virtually with the Irish Foreign Minister, and consider some important international issues, including climate change and regional priorities. UN agencies support to the region during COVID-19, small states and multilateralism in the 75th year of the UN. At this meeting, we also heard from the well-known Sir Hilary Beckles on the issue of reparations and noted the suggestion in that we should place reparations at the center of development in the region. Mr. Speaker, these are important meetings that ordinarily I would have been sitting in a room in New York. And here I was attending, sitting in a room in Bastia. The only thing it cost was a boat fee from Nevis. A cost-effective way of engaging diplomatically occasioned by COVID. And a way that I'm advocating, we ought to seek as much as possible to continue. In the 26th of October, I was pleased to participate in the dialogue of ministers of foreign affairs and high-level authorities of Latin America and the Caribbean on the post-pandemic economic recovery. I was also able, Mr. Speaker, to participate in a virtual meeting with the UN resident coordinator based in Barbados regarding the framework of UN reform and the UN's enhanced efforts to provide in-country support to small island developing states. On the 14th to 15th December 2020, just a few days ago, 
I participated in the EU, Latin America and Caribbean ministerial meeting and was able to share our own local response to COVID-19 and make a call for continued assistance, especially with respect to access to vaccines for the poor and the vulnerable. The meeting was chaired by the Foreign Minister of Germany, as Germany is currently the chair of the EU Council. I also use the occasion, Mr. Speaker, to raise the urgent need for vulnerability index as part of the analysis of which countries are truly high income or middle income. And Mr. Speaker, just for the benefit of the public, the approach that is currently used is a sterile measure of GDP per capita. So if you have a high GDP per capita, they say that you are middle income or upper income, high income country, and as a result, you are unable to access any concessionary financing or any overseas development assistance. We have argued that that measure doesn't take into account our extreme vulnerability. And as we've seen in our region, a single storm, or in this context, COVID-19, can wipe out all the gains that we would have made. And so we continue to advocate in every forum for vulnerability index to be a part of the analysis when that type of determination is being made. Mr. Speaker, we did not stop there. I was very pleased that for the first time in our history, the Honorable Prime Minister, the Deputy Prime Minister, and I were able to engage in a virtual diaspora forum with our nationals abroad. I understand that over 400 of our citizens registered for this initiative. This was a collaborative effort of the ministry through the Embassy of St. Kitts and Nevis to the United States, the St. Kitts and Nevis Association of Philadelphia, and the Regional Integration and Diaspora Unit in the Office of the Prime Minister. Imagine, for a moment, Mr. Speaker, that we again on a Zoom call, the Prime Minister, the Deputy Prime Minister, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, on a Zoom call with 400 of our nationals. I recall there were people from Philadelphia, New York, Birmingham, Leeds, London. Now, could you imagine the cost if we had to put that together to meet face to face? But instead, we simply got on the line and we spoke and had a virtual meeting. Virtual meetings, of course, have their own dynamics, but the engagement can be as beneficial and as fruitful as in-person meetings. Mr. Speaker, let me move quickly to advise the House and the nation that we have some new appointments and accreditations. We welcome to our Overseas Consular Corps, Ms. Rodina Reed, as St. Kitts and Nevis Honorary Consul to Jamaica. You will recall, Mr. Speaker, that we recently lost His Excellency Cedric Harper, who served as our High Commissioner to Jamaica for many years. We continue to thank him for his long and outstanding service and to thank his family for lending him to us for all these years. Ms. Reed is a Ketishan by birth, but she has lived in Jamaica since the early 1970s. She has had a successful career as an educator and guidance counselor and senior assistant registrar at the University of the West Indies Mona campus. She has also served as staff advisor to the University of the West Indies St. Kitts and Nevis Students Association, an appointment she still holds even after she has retired. We are also pleased to announce the appointment of an ambassador to St. Kitts and Nevis from Ethiopia for the very first time in our history. This ambassador will be resident in Cuba. This, Mr. Speaker, is very significant very, very significant, because we have talked and talked and talked about closer connection with Africa. We are of Africa, and many, I believe, have agreed that there ought to be a closer nexus between the Caribbean and Africa, that we ought, in every sense, to be a part of the so-called sixth region of Africa. Ethiopia is important diplomatically and strategically. Why? Because Ethiopia hosts the headquarters of the African Union in Addis Ababa. And therefore, it affords St. Kitts and Nevis an opportunity to engage through Ethiopia with the African Union. And I will go further. 
it affords CARICOM an opportunity to engage. And Mr. Speaker, it ought to be of interest to you and to the nation that CARICOM with its 13 independent members, the African Union with 55 countries, independent countries, that together they constitute 35% of the nations reflected at the United Nations. If you're able to add the Latin American countries, that jumps from 35% to 52%, a clear majority of nations at the UN. I say that because in multilateral organizations, because of the approach of multilateralism, each country has the same one vote, despite your size. And so numbers matter. And if we can harness the synergies to bring Africa through the African Union and the Caribbean through CARICOM together, to add Latin America, whether through CELAC or any of those organizations, we become a potent force in the multilateral organizations around the world. WHO, United Nations, and any of the various organizations emanating therefrom. And that, I think, is the vision and the idea that we would like to achieve. Spain, they have appointed a new honorary consul in the person of Ms. Giselle Clark, a local attorney of part Spanish heritage. Her Excellency Sherry Truss was able to present her credentials to Panama. She's now our ambassador to Panama, and she was able to do that virtually. And I'm advised, Mr. Speaker, that ambassadors of the Netherlands and the Republic of Ethiopia, accredited to St. Kitts and Nevis, will present their credentials virtually to His Excellency the Governor General on Thursday, 17 December, and next week, Tuesday, 22nd. So today, Thursday, 17th, and next week, they will present virtually again. Normally, they don't have to travel here to do it, but they're doing so virtually. Let me pivot quickly, Mr. Speaker, to talk about scholarships. I know sometimes people get tired of hearing me talk about scholarships. But I talk about them every time because, again, my foreign service officers will say that in any meeting that I attend, my first agenda item always is to ask about training opportunities for our people. And I have not been shy. I have benefited from scholarships all my life. All my life. I was the first Social Security scholarship winner when I was but a boy, long, long time ago. I went on and I won a scholarship to study law at the University of the West Indies from the Nevis Island Administration. I went on, I won a scholarship to go to Oxford University to do postgraduate work. And so I have seen the value of scholarships in my own life. And I continue to advocate strongly that where possible our young people seize the opportunities that are being made available for training. It doesn't have to be a university degree. Sometimes it's training, a short course, but seize the opportunity because I lament all the time, Mr. Speaker, that I go and I beg and countries respond favorably because I make a compelling case that St. Kitts and Nevis students want the opportunity to study and then after the countries come back to me and they say, nobody has applied. I have said it often, I'm sure people get tired of the joke, but I'll say it anyway because I only have a few jokes in my repertoire. That we had scholarships offered to Georgia. And we had a mother who came in and was very excited about her son going to Georgia. And as we advanced the paperwork, and she realized that it was Georgia the country and not Georgia in the United States. She said, no, not too far. And her son ain't going to know Georgia. She thought it was Georgia in America. And we have a fixation, it seems to me, in our country that unless you go, go and can go to America to study, that somehow you're not going. And that is why I'm so pleased now to see how many young people are applying to go to Taiwan. 
I have shared, as I continue to encourage our people to be the best that they can, that when the Taiwanese foreign minister visited, I was able to host him in Nevis, and we had him on Pelia. And a young lady who had studied in Taiwan came out to serve something. And I can't tell you what she said, but she said something in Mandarin. And the foreign minister was so pleased, he responded in Mandarin, and they had a little chat. I said, Shishi. Shishi. Because that's all I know. But they had a little chat, you know how proud that made me to see a little woman from Nevis talking to the foreign minister of Taiwan in his language. These are the things that make my heart glad as somebody at this point in my life who's in public service. So our young people now are grabbing the opportunities to go to Taiwan and I'm asking and inviting them to continue to grab the opportunities and while I'm here today and while I ask and I plead and I beg our young people to seize the opportunities, let me say how pleased I am that for the first time in the history of St. Kitts and Nevis, we have had students step up to the plate. And guess what, Mr. Speaker? We have a young lady who's going to Azerbaijan. I think you mentioned her. We have now some people who are going to Romania. And at long last, some young people have stepped up to go to Morocco. Because we have been begging and we've been asking and beseeching. And I'm hopeful that these are just but the first wave. When I visited Romania, I was shocked at the number of universities in Romania. And the fact, Mr. Speaker, that Romanian universities, I'm told, have been educating Europe for a very long time. They were particularly talented in areas of technology. And they have much that we can benefit from. So when we go and we hear scholarships are available, but our people don't want to go because that's too far. I want to go to Monroe because Monroe is in New York. I want to go to Texas. I want to go to UBI because I'm a member for number five and the senator in UBI. Mm -hmm. And they're bright, so I want to go there too. We must encourage our people to spread their wings. I have seen in my own time poor families go to development bank to borrow money they can't afford. Put up their piece, a little land or a little house as security because the child must go to UVI or Monroe, must be in New York or Texas. And I said to them, you could go to Taiwan for free. F-R-E-E, -E, free. When you're done, you don't own nobody. You come back and the first check you make is yours. You put it in your pocket because you don't have a student loan. And I encourage people, because sometimes you got to talk to people raw so they could understand what you're saying. Why are you going to borrow money when you could get something for free? Because at the end of the day, you know, Mr. Speaker, not a soul asking you where you get your degree from. Some of us may think it's important, you know. Remember for number four, oh, I went to Harvard. <laughs> Some say I went to Cambridge. But at the end of the day, well, some went to Oxford as well. But <laughs> at the end of the day, Mr. Speaker, it matters very little. What the degree does, it expands your mind. And could you imagine you go to Morocco and you come back here, you know Arabic, you know French, you clearly know English, that's your native tongue, and you have your degree on top of that. You go to Mexico, you come back speaking fluent Spanish. Hasta luego, hasta la vista. Taiwan is Mandarin, she she. Ni hao. Ni hao, what is that? Ni hao. You look Chinese too, don't you? Remember, for number one, look Chinese. What's she she? What's she she? Huh? What's the meaning of she she? We don't, we're not so sure, so we'll leave that. <laughs> We, we, don't, we don't want to put anything that is wrong in the record. So these are some of the things of so the ability of our people 
to get the education, to get the language, to get immersed in the culture. I mean, Lord, if they go get married and bring back a husband or wife too. Because what better diplomacy than people to people? What better diplomacy? People to people, when you know about the people's food and their culture, that is the best diplomacy. So I continue to encourage, and I'm so proud that people are starting. There's a trickle. I want the trickle to become a flood. Despite the pandemic, or perhaps because of the pandemic, forgive me, some have started online. But I'm told that one of our nationals has now settled in Romania and is enjoying her first semester of her career. And I'm going to have a little problem here, Mr. Speaker, because this word was put here, but I've never seen it. Kine, kinesiotherapy. Kinesiotherapy. That sound right, Wendy? You're the authority. Kines, kinesiotherapy. I actually Googled it, and it's something like physical therapy. Kinesiotherapy. But one of our people, one of our young people has gone to Romania to do that. Now, I've mentioned that area of study because our people are charting new waters, applying to universities, what was seemingly a far-flung place. I'm inviting our young people to seize those opportunities. Grab them with both hands. Go and make something of yourself. And we at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs will continue to advocate and continue to bring the scholarships. But when we bring them, apply for them. I don't want to pick on the clerk again, but clerk I know has been a Shevlin scholar. Bright people. Saint Gis Nevis, in fact, per capita has had a lot of Shevlin scholars. I can think of my colleague in cabinet in Nevis, young little Hazel Brandy, Shevlin scholar. Young lady merchant, Shevlin scholar. Chanel Simmons. Simmons. Yeah, Chanel speak Mandarin better than she speak English. Shevlin scholar. A lot of our people, with all them a female. Oh, Chris, I get one guy, one man among the females. But the reality, Mr. Speaker, is the fact that our young people, including our clerk, would have competed regionally and won the right to go to do their masters in the UK under that program. All of these are made available and possible because of diplomacy, because of our diplomatic relations. And I can't emphasize enough. I will add, before I close off on the scholarships, that through our High Commission's outreach in Ottawa, we have been able now to take up a scholarship at the Nova Scotia Institution of Higher Learning. And I want to encourage that effort because we continue to reach out to universities and colleges in Canada to get from them opportunities for our people. Mr. Speaker, just to give a flavor of what is available, we have things like leadership in court governance offered in Singapore, workshop on disaster resilient infrastructure being offered in India, Short-term courses for police officers. Officers, if you are listening, short-term courses for officers, fingerprint identification, examination of crime scene, modern forms and methods of countering extremism and terrorism, combating illicit traffic of drugs. All of this is happening in Russia. We have Madam Senator and Minister of Trade, WTO Advanced Trade Policy Course being offered in Geneva. We have public officials and junior diplomats courses being offered in Austria. Environmental conservation and sustainability member for number 10 being offered in Singapore. Technical vocation, education, training in industry, technologies. Again, Singapore. Sustainable solid waste management. Who's responsible for solid waste now? Yeah. Member for number eight? Yeah. Send some of your people to Japan. Aika is offering that, JICA, sorry, forgive me, JICA. Building social cohesion and plural society, Singapore. Teaching of Spanish as a second language for all of you who don't know the habla la lengua. Hello, Alexis. He's not here. 
Speaker habla mucho una lengua. Habla poquito. That's been offered in Colombia. We have diplomatic training in Kenya, diplomatic training in the Netherlands. Chile is offering for those who want to do a PhD. We have two doctors in opposition. One PhD over here and one medical doctor over here. But for those over here who want another PhD, Chile. I say all that to say, look at it, renewable energy, Japan, non-communicable diseases in Morocco, training, pages and pages, courses and training that's available. The Ministry of Foreign Affairs is here to help anybody who's interested. Please contact us and let us take advantage. You know, I say I want to leave this thing, but I'm so passionate about it. You know why, Mr. Speaker? I see a country that has done remarkably well for itself out of these programs. Right in the OECS, St. Vincent and the Grenadines. When I went to Romania, St. Vincent was one of the few countries that had students in Romania. Because whatever a kip, Vincentians are there. Here? Oh, I didn't know. Really? That too far? We get into a kind of comfort zone in Sinkis and Nevis. And I'm encouraging our people to break out of that. Get yourself in a position. Benefit from what's available. We are working for you. But you must now make the step and make it happen. We have gone so far, you know, in Nevis, we've actually set up a scholarship desk within human resources to help youngsters because some of them come and all oh, the farm too complicated. We, we help. We want the young people to take advantage. And I go back to the point I make, Lord, it may sound like I'm repeating ad nauseum, but I go back to the point that I'm making. It is far better to get an education for free than it is to burden yourself with large student loans and burden your family, particularly poor families. Take advantage of the opportunities we have some young people who have gone to Cuba to do medicine. See, somebody has gone to Cuba here to do a PhD in, in communications. Taiwan, I've listed. Romania, I want to, let me, let me name out the people who are in Romania because they, they are the trailblazers. Miss Nikova Diamond, Miss Kiana Lawrence, Mr. Joshua Salters. One is doing Kenya. Kenya therapy. One is doing visual arts, one is doing horticulture. Could you imagine? A bachelor's in horticulture. All of you who like us flowers, isn't it? Mm -hmm. yeah. All of you who like flowers, we're going to have somebody with a bachelor's in that soon. From Romania. For free. F-R-E-E. -E. We have going to Azerbaijan, Miss Kyla Weeks. She's going to do international studies. Then we have Kelsey Alibert. She's from Nevis. Hilary Ferguson, I think, is from Nevis as well. And both of those are doing hospital, one is doing hospitality management and one is doing master of education. Oh, Hillary Ferguson, okay. And they both won OS scholarships. Morocco, Miss Andrean Tyrrell is doing sociology. We have Austrian program for foreign students and they have a big cap here to give me, they say no applicants. No applicants, break my heart, Russia. One year Russian language, if you want to say Nostarovia, you go and you do that. You see how versatile I am, Mr. Speaker? I know one word in almost every language in the world. <laughs> Nostarovia, Russian language, and from there you get one year and then you go to the Moscow University in the Ministry of Internal Affairs, Ural Law University or Rostov Law University. Again, not a solar play. Japan is offering postgraduate scholarships, not a solar play. And then CARICOM, at the CARICOM level, you have PhD scholarships, various programs, they're all available, please. I think I've made my point. I want to encourage our people to take advantage. Let me switch gears, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I'm very proud of our efforts to expand the diplomatic footprint of Sinkis and Years. For far too long, we focus our diplomacy on what I would call the well-known and established partners, those in Europe, Canada, and the United States. 
The mandate that I received from the cabinet was to seek to widen and deepen our diplomatic footprint, particularly, as I mentioned prior, with the continent of Africa. Despite, of course, the slowdown occasioned by COVID this year, I believe that we've made good progress. Since 2015, I'm pleased to report to the House and to the nation that we've established formal diplomatic relations with 39 additional countries, including three this year, being Bangladesh, Djibouti, which is in Africa, and the Hoshimite Kingdom of Jordan. In terms of visa waivers, Mr. Speaker, we are aware that our primary industry continues to be tourism, and I've argued that St. Kitts and Nevis should seek to make access to our shores as easy as possible on a reciprocal basis so that those who wish to come to us without the hassle of having to apply for a visa should equally be willing to extend to us that same courtesy. And so I'm proud that since 2015, Mr. Speaker, we have been able to negotiate some 28 new visa-free arrangements. In fact, in the last two weeks, we were able to conclude visa-free arrangements with the Kingdom of Eswatini. For those who are wondering, that is in Africa and was formerly Swaziland. They have changed their name. And just recently, I believe in the last two days, we were able to conclude visa-free arrangements with North Macedonia. It means, therefore, that with a St. Kitts and Nevis passport, we can now access some 158 countries of the world without a visa. I think for a small country, that is remarkable, Mr. Speaker. It means that you can take up your passport tomorrow, close your eyes, throw a dart at the map of the world, and wherever that dart lands, you say, I will visit. And it is my task as Minister of Foreign Affairs to ensure that you have no hassle. That when you get there, they say, enter without let or hindrance. The reason why I believe this is so important is because it sends a clear message that countries have the necessary confidence in the stability in the safety and security of St. Kitts and Nevis, that they can say to citizens of St. Kitts and Nevis, whether you're from Phillips or Keon, Molyneux or Gingerland, Cotton Ground or Barnsworth, they say to you, come without let or hindrance to our country. Show your passport and you're free to enter. And we are not to take it for granted. I hope my good friend doesn't get upset with me. But I have a close friend here on St. Kitts, who is Jamaican. Every time I go by him, he extols the virtue of St. Kitts and Nevis. And that is a point that I always marvel at, that when our own people are trying to pull down our country, those who are coming in are saying what a great country we have. The gentleman said things so nice in St. Kitts and Nevis. He said, granny and all, he bring to live here now. Granny and all. And Mr. Speaker, the gentleman has obtained citizenship here. And he said to me that he marveled that he traveled to London. And he said when he went up, he frightened when he go up to the immigration, and the man only stamped it and said, enjoy your stay. Never see nothing like that. Because if he had a Jamaican passport, crap or smoky pipe. Marveled. <coughs> Things that we are here taking for granted, other countries are struggling to achieve. You hear how big and powerful Jamaica is compared to little St. Nevis? But my friend is telling me because he now has citizenship here. He travels now to see his family in London without let or hindrance. And his joy in showing his St. Nevis passport, then they say, welcome. Six months, and he gone and he gets on the tube. And he's away. Number six, what I call the fast train that take you from London Gatwick. Number six. 
Oh, he's fast asleep. Okay. Asleep. No, you might. I know you've taken that. Oh, the Gatwick Express. <laughs> Gatwick Express. Want to remember? Yes. The time has expired. Oh, Mr. Speaker, you've got to give me a little bell or something to let me know I'm coming up. I could have sped up. But. Okay, you see, you're giving the bell now. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, can I respectfully ask for an additional half an hour? I'll try to be less, but since that's the maximum that's allowed under the rules, can I ask for half an hour? The question is that the Honourable Member requires an additional 30 minutes. Those in favour? Aye. Those against? The ayes have it. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, what the advancement in visa waiver arrangements has also done for us, it has also meant that our passport has now become one of the most valuable in the world. And we advise at this point the second most valuable in our entire region, second only, I believe, to Barbados at this point. And if we continue our steady march of visa waiver arrangements, I anticipate that in God's good time, St. Kitts and Nevis will have the most powerful passport in the entire Caribbean and Latin American region. Let me switch gears and talk a bit about the UPR report. I am happy to report that St. Kitts and Nevis was able to meet the deadline to submit in its third cycle universal periodic review report by October 12, 2020. As you know, Mr. Speaker, this is an international obligation of every UN member state to report on the government's promotion and protection of human rights. We are slated to present the report before the 37th session of the Human Rights Council on 19th of January 2021, and this will be done again virtually. The ministry spearheads this initiative every four years, supported by line ministries including social services, Community Development and Gender, the Ministry of Justice and Legal Affairs, the Ministry of National Security, the Ministry of Education and the Ministry of Health, who comprise the National Mechanism for Reporting and Facilitation. And so I'm very proud that again, despite the ravages of COVID, we have done what is necessary and that we have submitted our report for the Universal Periodic Review. Conventions and treaties that we've ratified in 2020 we have facilitated thus far this year the signing and ratification of a number of conventions and treaties, included among these the United Nations Convention Against Torture and other cruel or degrading treatment or punishment. As a state party, St. Kitts and Nevis is obligated to uphold the tenets in ensuring that there is no torture committed within its territory and to criminalize all acts of torture. We have acceded to the Hague Convention on the Protection of Children and cooperation in respect of inter-country adoption. This will allow for a more seamless process of adoption of children from other state parties to this convention. We have acceded to the International Convention for the Suppression of Acts of Nuclear Terrorism. This allows for the criminalization of a number of nuclear and radioactive material related offenses. The establishment of jurisdiction over these offenses and cooperation among state parties. Based on UN Resolution 1373, St. Kitts and Nevis is obliged to adopt counter-terrorism laws in an effort to prevent the proliferation of weapons of man's mass destruction. St. Kitts and Nevis' accession to the Convention, Mr. Speaker, sends a very clear message regarding our seriousness in helping to fight international terrorism. We have signed and acceded to the Convention on Offenses and certain other acts committed on board aircraft, the Tokyo Convention. We have signed the protocol to amend the Convention on Offenses and certain other acts committed on board aircraft, the Montreal Protocol. We have signed the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. And this is important, Mr. Speaker, because it's a legally binding instrument to prohibit nuclear weapons. St. Kitts and Nevis, as a signatory state, shares deep concerns as it relates to the threat that nuclear weapons pose to humanity and the need to usher in a new era of a world without nuclear weapons. Ratification by St. Kitts and Nevis occurred significantly on the 70, 75th anniversary since the United States dropped an atomic bomb 
on the Japanese city of Nagasaki. In honor of the victims and survivors, St. Kitts and Nevis ratified the treaty on that day. We have also ratified the Multilateral Air Services Agreement, MASA, that seeks to establish a single market for air transport services within the community in furtherance of the undertaking of member states under paragraph 1 of Article 33 and paragraph 1 of Article 37 of the revised treaty to remove barriers to the right of establishment of community, that is Car CARICOM community nationals, and the right of community nationals to provide services within the community. So, I say all that to say this, that we have not rested despite COVID. We have continued to work and to do the work that our ministry has set out for us and that the people of St. Kitts and Nevis demand. Let me pivot now to civil aviation. Aviation, of course, plays an essential role. And notwithstanding that our airports were closed for some eight months, we still have a regulatory oversight to ensure that our air transport is safe. The aviation industry has not been spared from the brunt of this crisis. And ICAO estimates that air passenger traffic will suffer an overall reduction between 57% and 61% in 2020 compared to 2019. The ICAO, through the Council's Aviation Recovery Task Force report and the associated takeoff guidance document, provides guidance to states to recover from this pandemic and to restart the industry. The organization's Global Implementation Roadmap document also contributes to the restart and recovery of the civil aviation system by establishing an enabling framework for ICAO to effectively implement the recommendations and guidance. Mr. Speaker, I am pleased to report that since our borders reopened at the end of October, a number of airlines have already begun services to the Federation, including Air Sunshine, Silver Airways, also known as Seaborne, American Airlines, British Airways, Liat, Sky High, Transanguilla Airways, United Airlines. We have also had private charters by SVG, Airways and Carib Air Charters. In Nevis, we have seen the return of Cape Air and Coastal Air. In Agudishan, Air Sunshine and Transanguilla have also been flying into Nevis. Since our borders reopened, the last statistics that I had say as of Saturday the 13th of December, some 1,166 passengers have arrived on some 446 flights, 284 on St. Kitts, and 162 on Nevis. The passengers are of various nationalities, Mr. Speaker, Canadians, South Koreans, Nigerians, Italians, Mexicans, Peruvians, Americans, and obviously some from our region. If I shift now and speak to training, also in the context of aviation, the Civil Aviation Division, although it has only four members, it is quite active during the year. We have been able to conduct training with a total of 556 persons spanning from SCASPA here in St. Kitts to NASPA in Nevis to customs and private entities, including KDP Enterprises and TDC Airlines. In addition to refresher courses, training was conducted to IKO standard in the COVID-19 era. Our officers were themselves able to secure online training from IKO in areas including collaborative arrangement, for the prevention and management of public health events in civil aviation, the IKO Public Health Corridor Assessment of Aviation Safety Risks Related to COVID-19 and Digital Transformation. Our Aviation Division also issued permits during this period to two new carriers, Coastal Air and Kalita Charters. The latter does seasonal supplemental cargo lifts for Amerijet. Officers have regular inspections at our ports and have developed a number of safety and security programs for aviation-related entities. I'm also delighted to report, Mr. Speaker, that the division, in collaboration with the IT department, has established a civil aviation website with a confidential reporting mechanism that affords the public the opportunity to report anonymously on any matter in relation to aviation. Maintaining safety at our airports and at our aerodromes requires an all-of-society approach 
And this is a channel by which the public can play a pivotal role in helping to achieve this. Let me use this rostrum to congratulate Mr. Royston Griffin and the entire team who continue to perform incredibly well. Small team, only four members, but doing great things. Our new initiatives for the coming year, we will have a high school quiz. We're proposing to have a quiz among Fort Farm students focused on heightening awareness of our work. We're also proposing to have an SKN Consular and Diplomatic Forum. We think that there's much potential for networking and greater collaboration and harmonizing of our efforts between our consular and diplomatic corps overseas. We believe, Mr. Speaker, that there needs to be a greater synergy and understanding between what we need here on the ground and how our representatives abroad can best help us to deliver. Mr. Speaker, that forum, we hope, we will convene together with local stakeholders, our overseas missions, as well as our consular corps. When travel restrictions are eased, at some point in the future, Mr. Speaker, we intend to organize trade missions to various locations worldwide to continue to promote our tourism, CBI, and other products. Mr. Speaker, I've come now to the point I'm sure that you wanted me to get to the conclusion. But before I conclude, let me simply say that this budget is, as I said when I presented my own budget in Nevis, one that is fit for purpose. I borrow that phrase from the member from number 10. We must all agree that we are in an unprecedented time. And not since the flu influenza pandemic of 1918 has the world seen anything like COVID. And that brought with it its own challenges. We had certainly limitations in terms of our knowledge. I have said time and time again that there was no blueprint, no manual. We couldn't go to the bookshop and say, can I buy the book on how to handle a COVID-19 pandemic? And so we have had in many respects to make it up as we go, to be agile, to adjust, to adapt, to change where necessary, but to constantly keep our people safe. The budgeting process is always difficult. It is made even more difficult when we have a tightening and dramatic reductions in our income because our main engines to generate revenue, like our hotel sector, have been closed down. When our people are unemployed, and at the same time, we have increased pressure on expenditure, upward pressure. So, imagine, Mr. Speaker, you have downward pressure on your income, upward pressure on your expenditure. Because we've had to find money for our opening of our schools, refitting our schools. When the member for number two comes, I'm sure he's going to speak to that. Difficulties in terms of our airport, we would have heard the member from number four, all the money we have to spend at the RLB. In Nevis Advanced Army International to get the airports ready. Schools, money spent, you would have heard from the Minister of Health. Member for number three, unbudgeted because we weren't thinking about COVID in the last year. We have to find money. PPE, I didn't even know what PPE meant until COVID. We know how to find money for vaccines, so we, we ain't stopped spending yet, you know, Mr. Speaker. And so you have the twin pressures, reduced, dramatically reduced income, revenue, and dramatically increased expenditure. That is why I said the budget is fit for purpose. It is realistic. It doesn't contain any pie-in-the-sky promises. It says to our people that we must tighten our belts because hard times have come. Not through any fault of our own, not through any mismanagement or lack of transparency or good governance, but rather because we have been afflicted by COVID-19 which has inflicted considerable damage on all of us globally. And we cannot escape that. It is not that we are using it as an excuse. It is our reality. 
And we need only to look at our television screens to see that that is the reality in countries large and small, rich and poor. That COVID has brought even great economies like the United States and the United Kingdom to their knees. And that is why I have to commend the move of the bill, the Prime Minister and Minister of Finance, the Financial Secretary, and the entire team. And commend the Cabinet too. Because the process over here is a very open and transparent one where all Cabinet members participate in the budget discussions leading up to the compilation of the budget. The ministries don't always get what they want. The ministers don't always get what they want. But at the end of the day, we have a document that is fit for purpose. And a document that speaks to the challenges, but also the hopes and aspirations for the nation of St. Kitts and Nevis for the new fiscal year. And so I commend all who have been involved. My ministry, the ministry that I'm privileged to lead, Foreign Affairs and Aviation, is very much aware of the economic constraints the pandemic would have caused. And we will therefore guard prudently the funds allocated to us. Incidentally, I want to again commend the Permanent Secretary because she is so proper about whatever she does that each year we find ourselves well within what the language is, the envelope that we are given. Lord, sometimes the envelope is a bit small. But we find ourselves within the envelope because we manage things well at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Aviation. We will prioritize activities and items that will yield the most benefits to the Ministry and the country by extension. I register my thanks to the Prime Minister and his team for the allocation to my Ministry and assure him, the Cabinet, the Parliament and the public that we will use that money wisely. Before I sit, Mr. Speaker, in the two minutes or so I have left, let me also report the very good news, which I'm sure perhaps the Minister of Finance in his wrap-up will speak to, that we have now been removed from all lists, prejudicial as they are, which suggest that we are in any way uncooperative in relation to tax matters, money laundering, terrorist financing, or anything of the sort. We are not on any list anymore. We used to be on some so-called blacklists. Then we want some so-called gray lists. We are now on no lists. And I believe that that, again, speaks to good governance. It speaks to a government that sets priorities. It speaks to a government that is serious about advancing the interests of the people of St. Christopher and Nevis. Mr. Speaker, I would like with those very, very few words to commend this budget to safe passage for this honorable house and to say that I support wholeheartedly the efforts as articulated therein for the future benefit of our people and our young nation. Mr. Speaker, I so move. Thank you.